The other day, I spent three whole hours staring at a wall, which begs the question of, wow, what else am I capable of? Not saying that there's ever a great time for a global pandemic, but during the past month of quarantine and social distancing, we have been gifted with an incredible variety of games to distract us from our impending doom. I've definitely spent more time tackling my backlog in this past month than I have in the entire year, since most of them are games like Persona 5, and it's like, how? How would I make content over this? But like, if I just played them in my own time and didn't mention them on my channel, how would I be able to write off Final Fantasy VII for my taxes? So I think I'm gonna start reviewing games in multiple, so essentially the steam cleaning of game reviews, if you will. I'm gonna talk about these five games, and I'm down to play five more for another video. I know that I'm gonna be playing these games soon, so be sure to let me know in the comments what else you'd like to see. And I'll add another game to this list for every 50k likes on the video, so be sure to subscribe, it helps me out more than you know, and hit the bell so you can see the future reviews so now let's start off with the base game of Persona 5 was one of my favorite games to ever exist all I ask for in a game is a stylistic UI a banging soundtrack and memorable environments needless to say Persona 5 knocks all of these out of course being a smash fanatic and everything I'm a sucker for good movement and yet somehow Persona 5 does this as an RPG and it makes no sense my biggest critique on the original game is that this character sucks the ending is messy and if genocide was a song it would sound like this As much as I love Persona 5, I'll be the first to admit the game had flaws, and I think Royal fixed all of them. Except for how white his eyes are! Are they okay? Did they file for divorce? With both of these games existing, people might ask, which version do I play? This one. You play this one. In my humble opinion, I think Royal outshines the original in every way imaginable. They introduce new locations, a new palace, new music, ugh, new characters, and then they flesh out all the other characters who needed it. They also introduce a lot of new features that are like super small things, but they just improve the quality of life so much, you're just like, how did I function without these before? The two most notable characters exclusive to Royal are Kasumi and Maruki. Kasumi was treated as the poster child next to Joker for the marketing, and they treat her story as this mystery right to the end. And it takes takes a very long time until she joins your party, but she still gets screen time, so you get to know her as a character. As for Maruki, he becomes a school counselor for Joker in the gang, and at first it seemed questionable, but I soon realized that this was a genius decision. What would normally be an invasion of privacy is now a tool to understand the main characters even better, with an evasion of privacy. By listening in on their therapy sessions, it allows you to learn much more about the characters' desires and fears, much more than they ever could divulge in naturally. I mean, imagine. Hey! Ryuji. I wanted to get a track scholarship for real to make it easier on my mom. Every palace in the game got reworked, sure, some more than others, and sure, some in completely worse ways, but regardless, it felt like a different experience throughout the game. Fairly rarely would I give a game a 10 out of 10 score, but Persona 5 Royal has joined my very highly coveted list. This game reeks a spoiler, so forgive me for my vague critique, but let's put it this way. Akechi was one of my least favorite characters, and now I think he's probably one of the best written characters in the entire game. Also, I have a lot more to say about this game, but it's all very spoiler heavy, so I'm going to be talking about that at the end of the video, so just know that's going to be there. But Royal changed up a lot, and I couldn't be happier, so if you're trying to distract yourself for nearly 100 hours during this crisis period, this is absolutely the game for you. And now let's talk about the song! I believe God! I actually played this game during my content break at the start of this year, but I've never really found an opportunity to talk about it, so... <clears throat> Indivisible is like if Street Fighter met Dragon Quest in an Applebee's bathroom and left Mario to raise the child. I don't know if that sells the game or not, but the studio also made Skullgirls, which explains the gorgeous art style since every frame is hand-drawn. The only other game that comes to mind in recent years is Cuphead, because no one's insane enough to do that anymore. Indivisible is a journey about Ajna, a girl who is impulsive, hot-headed, and everything a hero isn't, yet constantly wants to be one. Her recklessness definitely carries her throughout the adventure, but it ultimately reaches a point where it is her downfall. 
I wouldn't call this a spoiler since it's just basic storytelling, I mean, come on. But her biggest strength eventually becomes her biggest downfall. The story begins with Ajna learning how to blog, but she doesn't quite see a need for it given her hothead nature and her desire to stay on the offensive. Which is very fitting since at the end of her journey, the final move she performs is, you guessed it, blocking. Indivisible definitely has its slow parts, but it excels in storytelling through gameplay better than any game I've ever played. All of the abilities she learns in the beginning are very flashy and designed for damage, yet as the game progresses, a lot of her power-ups flirt with movement, or better yet, defensive options. Outside of the fighting, this game moonlights as a platformer, and it starts off a bit clunky, but becomes a little more fluid as the game progresses. I don't know if this is a metaphor in thematic painting through gameplay, but personally, I just wish it felt smooth throughout the entire game, but eh, I'll take what I can get. The two weakest points of this game were how cheesy the dialogue was, and multiple times I was left thinking, Huh, now where do I go? This game is only about 20 hours, so I think you get the bang for your buck here. It's not as long as, say, Persona, but the game's only like 15, 20 bucks depending on where you get it from. Indivisible left a heavy emotional impact on me and much more than the majority of the games I've played in my life. Watching a reckless character reeking of unearned confidence quickly be humbled by the hardships of life is always an entertaining tale, especially since you know they, they won't give up, it's a story. The difference here, however, is that the game itself would have done a great job telling you the story, even without dialogue. I've said it before, but this game does an incredible job of just painting the theme through gameplay and that alone. And can we mention again that every frame is hand-drawn? This review is a little bit different since I absolutely have made content over Animal Crossing, but all of those videos were from the first couple days of playing. And Animal Crossing isn't really a game where you get to write a review for after a few hours of gameplay. What I'm about to say might feel like karma for the anti-time travelers brigade, but I feel like this game simply just didn't have enough. New Horizons is a phenomenal installment to the series, don't get me wrong, but it just doesn't captivate me like New Leaf did. A while ago, I actually reset my Switch's clock to current time, and I kind of used that fake apology video to pseudo-announce that. But the thing was, I time-traveled to get everything how I wanted to get the stores, etc, etc, and now I don't really mind just playing day by day. I just didn't want to wait for what I felt were the bare necessities of your island. Regardless, I understand that New Horizons is going to receive updates way more than any other Animal Crossing game ever has. So with that being said, it almost feels wrong to claim that this game is empty. I know that we're going to get so much more content in the game, but I just wish we had more in the base game. There were just so many NPCs that I'm missing, and I just don't feel like I'm seeing any of the characters I know and love. I'm sure they're going to come back eventually, but you guys get what I'm saying. I don't think it's an unfair claim to have, but I think it's worth noting that New Horizons is definitely the most different Animal Crossing has ever been. I really miss the heavy drum machine soundtrack, but I like this new upbeat one too. I love being surprised with the villagers I got in my town, but I also like handpicking my favorite ones to join my island. I love the vast amounts of furniture options, but I also enjoy customizing my own furniture. Three examples is enough. My point is that every complaint of this game feels like a double-edged sword. I like it for the same reasons I dislike it, and I can only rationalize it by saying that the game is different. You get to customize your entire island and terraform it to your heart's desire. It's insane and different. As excited as I am for event updates in the future, I would desperately love some quality of life changes in this game as well. Let us craft multiple items at once. Don't let my golden tools break. Give us happy home designer version of terraforming since it's just so slow. Oh, and please bring back Froggy Chair. This game has so much going for, and I feel like this will be a completely different review in three years since Nintendo is wanting to push updates for this game for a long time. Given how fast it's sold, I can't say I blame them. New Horizons is a phenomenal game, a different game, and a game that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. All I ask is that it becomes a tad bit more expansive, and I have no doubts that it eventually will be. I'm just expressing how impatient I am. You know, the reason I time traveled. I have absolutely no idea why I played this game. Nobody directly suggested it to me or anything, I just heard the name being thrown around a bit over the past few years and the concept sounded cool. I did hear that the second one was better, but I wanted to play the original first before I dove into the sequel. Gravity Rush was a PS Vita game that was ported to the PS4, which is how I played it. The core mechanic is all about learning how to control gravity and it is just fun. No other word to describe it, it's just fun. The story though, it felt like I didn't care. Nothing really captivated me in that regard, I was just having fun flying around as a little ragdoll. The game isn't beautiful, but I'll attribute that to being a port from the PS Vita. I've seen trailers for the sequel however, and it just looks so much better, like exponentially better. 
As cool as the gravity shifting mechanic is, the novelty definitely starts to wear off after a little while. And then it sadly reveals the flaws of the rest of the game. I definitely noticed these flaws as the game started, but you're just having so much fun with this brand new mechanic you've never seen before, and you can't be stopped to think about such things. The game features a lot of platformer segments, but the movement in this game just isn't fluid enough outside of the gravity shifting to, like, warrant this platformer aspect. Beyond that, even during the gravity shifting feature, the camera gets all distorted during it constantly, and I can't help but to feel disoriented while doing so. Maybe that's the point. Either way, I didn't like it. I don't really know where the sequel will lead me, but I can at least say that I enjoyed this 10 hour game enough to want to tackle a longer, more polished installment of the series. The flaws weren't too bad to the point where I didn't feel like this could be fleshed out in the sequel. Gravity Rush definitely explores a lot of interesting ideas and innovates constantly, but I just feel like a lot of the execution fell slightly short. Outside of the soundtrack though, cause that shit slapped. One day in 2014, a young alpha rat graduated high school. He moved into his own apartment and finally tackled a hefty backlog of games, with Final Fantasy VII being one of those. Enough time passed and Square Enix announced the remake everyone has been waiting for. Little Alpha Boy saw the announcement and said, Oh cool, I'll just wait for that to come out instead. I was so naive, and spent half a decade putting this game off just to play the remake for my blind experience of Final Fantasy VII. So, verdict? I loved it. It all just felt so fleshed out. Every character felt so alive and vibrant in these breathtaking scenes. The entire game felt like a major motion picture, but like a good one, and you were in the driver's seat. I don't know how Square does it, but it was an unforgettable experience. A lot of people talking about this game have definitely played the original, so let me give you a little insight to how my experience was. The most notable and most astonishing part about this entire game was definitely the visuals, but the characters come in such a close second for me. They all felt chiseled with personality, and that includes the secondary characters like Biggs and Jesse. Also, everyone has been putting these two at war with each other, but can we talk about this glow up? I feel like my mans is not getting enough love. Don't get me wrong though, the Tifa and Aerith love is absolutely warranted. A lot of main cast characters in RPGs, sadly primarily female characters, don't really have identities outside of the main character. But the cast of women in this game felt like they were all super independent with unique personalities, which honestly isn't something you typically see in this genre. Boy, let's talk about the boys. Cloud. A lot of people told me he's this dorky mercenary, but I think they made him chat as hell in this game. Is he socially awkward or is he apathetic? It's beauty's in the eye of the beholder. His stoic disposition makes the women throw themselves at him and yet he remains apathetic in Valsel AF. It's also worth noting that somehow it's written in a way to make Cloud seem irresistible rather than downplaying the female characters. It's a very fine line, but they walked it with grace. Then last but not least, there's Barrett. This dude is one of the most passionate characters I've ever seen and his voice actor stands out amongst the pack by delivering that emotion through and through of this unit of a man. And then he sings. If you didn't know, this is not the full remake. Yeah, they're making like three or four of these. But if you've never played the full game before, I don't think you would tell. The remake feels complete until you get to the end. And that's when it gets a little messy. I believe that if you're going to twist the story from the original and then split it into parts, you got to write a more conclusive ending. I understand they're taking one segment from a larger story, but even episode 4 of Star Wars has a beginning, middle, and end, despite being part of a much larger narrative. The ending, though, it just kind of happens. It's designed to leave you wanting more, but you really don't, unless you know what's coming next. So yeah, I gave in and played the original game. When I was playing the remake, I really didn't notice too much padding in this 30 hour game. I mean, sure, there was an hour long motorcycle sequence, but the rest felt fairly tamed. It took me about five hours of playing the base game to catch up to where the remake ended, and that's when I realized. One, how in the hell did they drag these five hours into 30 whole hours? And two, these characters are ass. Throughout playing the original, I didn't have nearly the emotional attachment to these characters in the remake. It could be the fact that the remake was fully voiced, but even the dialogue in the original felt significantly more dry. Like, when I was writing this script, I had to go back and forth with this tons of times because I was like, God, do I really want to bash the original game in favor of the remake? Because that just sounds like I'm asking for angry comments. 
I know this might be a hot take given my inexperience to the game, but I can't say that I understand the characters of the main party nearly as well as I do in the remake. Also, by the way, if you want to play the original game, the Switch PS4 emulation version of it allows you to speed up the game up to three times, and the sound effects and music stay the exact same speed. Honestly, a godsend feature and a tool I didn't realize that I was missing in modern emulation until I experienced it. You can also turn on god mode and turn off random encounters, but those felt like they were taking too much away from the game for me. I don't really have a place to transition into talking about the soundtrack though, but dear god it's gorgeous. Genova has always been one of my all-time favorite VGM songs, but hearing it orchestrated and in proper context, oh, it was a genuine nut for me. After playing the remake, I realized that I would give absolutely anything to be a doormat to Tifa Lockhart's house, but after playing the original, I don't quite understand how this waifu debate was so big. These girls were dry. I feel so contrarian right now, and honestly, I kind of hate it, but I just don't get it. Their dialogue felt completely replaceable with the other, except Aerith was a flirt and Tifa was jealous. I'm not going to sit here and act like everything the remake did was an improvement, because one thing I do love about the original after playing it is that the narrative felt so much more streamlined, which obviously they intentionally tried to drag it out in the remake, but still, it's something I appreciated. I'm sure my opinions at large would be very different if I played the original first, but eh, this is where I'm at. So I'll change the topic before my subscribers tank. Oh. I know I've spent a long time talking about this game and I'm not going to bring up all the theories for future games or anything, but I gotta ask one more thing. Sephiroth. Why? I was shocked to play the original game and realize that he wasn't even in the remake portion, but the remake paints him as such a prominent character. It almost felt like everyone was pointing fingers at Square Enix, begging to see their gray-haired twink on the big screen so they felt obligated to include him somehow? The original paints him as such a powerful and mysterious being since you constantly hear about him before you ever get to learn anything about his character. Yet it's funny because you see so much of him in the remake yet know nothing about him and I think that's what my biggest gripe is. Sephiroth in the remake is essentially an email newsletter you don't remember signing up for. I wish they committed harder one way or the other with Sephiroth. He honestly doesn't add anything to the plot of the remake and ultimately just serves to have a final boss jammed into part one. But, like, what are we fighting for? We have no idea what Sephiroth stands for, and it just feels so out of place, especially since there were multiple fights before Sephiroth that very well could have been the final boss of the remake. I'm all for changing up the story from the original, I have no complaints on that. Providing two different experiences is honestly preferred with material like this, but I just wish they made him a bit more of a prominent antagonist or didn't feature him at all. I don't really care which, it just feels odd as it currently is. Nevertheless, Final Fantasy VII Remake was a breathtaking experience that I will never forget as I wait another half decade to relive it. Much like every other game on this list, I cannot suggest this one enough, regardless if you've played the original or not. So with all of that being said, let me leave you with one closing statement. <clears throat> Tifa Lockhart, kick my ass. Hey, it's me again. Remember when I said I wanted to talk about spoilers for Persona 5 Royal? Well, this is your warning. So fun fact, I recorded about a 13 minute narration of me talking about spoilers and then realized Atlas doesn't allow you to show any of this footage. So I scrapped all of it and I'm just gonna talk about the finale very briefly. Persona 5 Royal just touches on everything throughout the game and improves it constantly. And then the final palace is used to flesh out these two new characters and finally give resolution to this old one. When I saw Akechi in the boat scene in the base game, I just thought, wow, he sounds psychotic under this stress, but then you get to learn about him and you realize, oh, that's the real Akechi, because we actually fleshed him out and turned him into an actual character. He plays billiards with Joker while using his non-dominant hand just to make the ground a bit more fair because he wants a good fight. But even with that, he doesn't want to lose. And the same thing happens when he goes to Mementos to fight Joker because he only uses Robin Hood and not Loki. And that's the same thing as not using your dominant hand. Oh my God, oh, it's so good. My favorite part was just seeing Akechi's personality in its true form in the palace. And then they build up Violet's character throughout the entire game and finally give her some resolution. And God, dude. I could do a whole video talking about her character, so I'm just gonna lay off on that one right now because God, mmm. And Maruki was the cherry on top. He was the perfect antagonist that this game needed and note that I'm not using the word villain. Everything he wants to do can be summed up by reading the lyrics of Throw Away Your Mask. Maruki sacrificed the things he loved most to make the world better for everybody else and he's essentially replaced God. The ending of the base game was a little messy, but they use that as a stepping stone since Maruki now replaces God? 
He's living in this palace that is kind of like Mementos. It's not quite in the metaverse. I don't really know, I'll be honest. But he is having actual effects on the real world by making everybody's fantasy a reality. And a life without conflict is truly a boring one, so the Phantom Thieves constantly combat him, and you have to realize that what he's doing is very similar to what the Phantom Thieves have done the entire game. Sure, Marky is a bit more extreme, but it begs the question of morality. And I think if you constantly have to debate your morals against the antagonist, that is a well-written character. And the final boss, god I wish I could show it because everything felt perfect, the atmosphere, the music, the difficulty even. Throughout this boss fight you honestly have to use baton pass constantly, you need to switch out teammates and that's just incredible because this game is about the Phantom Thieves and they just make you feel like one unit. And everything before the final fight was great, like just built the tone so much because Marquis understands where the Phantom Thieves are coming from. He doesn't want to fight them but he will if he has to. Even when they give him the calling card, it's so somber because he just accepts it. He knows how they do this and he knows that this is his reality. He had studied cognitive science through and through, and he even saw the Phantom Thieves coming out of Kamashita's palace, which I a little cherry on top, you know? But honestly, just the final shot, the final X button you press, it was on a much smaller scale but felt so much more climactic than, you know, summoning Satan to fight God because there is this emotional value in it. And every single day since I beat that game, I have thought about that ending because I cannot get over how perfect it is. Every character felt resolved and this whole ending thematically made so much more sense for Persona 5 where I just have to wonder why it wasn't in the base game. But God, it was just phenomenal. So with that being said, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition comes out May 29th. <laughs>